Welcome back to Ben's Top 11. And when I was a kid, the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, was taken seriously. Hey, remember my little rant on Pixar? Probably, seeing as how it's only seven days old. I remember it, and I had the scars to prove it. Little word of advice, guys. If you're gonna send grenades to me in the mail, you might want to pull the pin first. And, I'm a cartoon character, so cyanide isn't going to work. Anyway, the point is, people think that I'm some person that likes everything Disney touches. I beg to differ. However, those are easy to hate because I'm not interested in pop stars, modern day superhero movies, and teen musicals. I'm interested in animation, which is what Disney is most known for. Well, used to be most known for. With all the Disney animated movies I love and admire, there are a few that I just don't like as much as the ones I love. That's right folks, as much as I love Disney, I'm not afraid to admit when they make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, they really make mistakes. So, I'm here to count down the top 11 Disney movies that I just don't like as much as the other Disney movies. So, get ready to send more grenades to me. Here are my top 11 Disney movies that I don't like very much. Number 11, The Jungle Book. Everyone and their mother has seen this movie. It's based off of the book by Rudyard Kipling and tells the story of an Indian boy named Mowgli who was raised by Bagheera but soon finds a parental figure in Baloo, a fun-loving bear. The two guardians debate on whether to let Mowgli stay in the jungle or return to the village as the vicious, mating tiger Shere Khan anticipates his attack on Mowgli. Growing up, I loved this film, but as I got older, it just became meh to me. I just think this movie is pretty boring for a Disney movie. There's not much conflict other than when Mowgli is hypnotized by Ka, played by Winnie the Pooh himself, Sterling Holloway, and when Mowgli is kidnapped by King Louie, and finally, Mowgli's final confrontation with Shere Khan. Come on! It's the Indian jungle! You'd think there would be more dangers than a snake, monkeys, and a tiger. I'm not very interested in Mowgli's character. I don't know how to describe it. He's just a regular boy who happens to live in the jungle. He was raised by a panther, and yet he walks like a regular human? Huh. Actually, I'm more interested in Bagheera and Baloo, played by Sebastian Cabot and Phil Harris respectively. And, who could forget George Sanders' performance as Shere Khan? Also, I don't like Bare Necessities. I know it's a popular Disney song, but I never liked it. The rhythm just doesn't click with me, and I know it's supposed to be laid back, but it just feels lazily put together. The only song I like in this movie is King Louie's song, I Wanna Be Like You. That is catchy as all heck. Yeah. Although I think the plot is boring, and the main character isn't that interesting, and the most popular song is... Ugh. I do like some things about it. The supporting characters, of course. King Louie's song, and the vultures that Mowgli meets towards the end of the film. Although they feel like the last minute add-on characters, I like how they're caricatures of the Beatles. Even though the vultures aren't voiced by the Fad Four themselves, combining the Beatles with Disney is an overload of epicness. So, yeah, The Jungle Book. Do I hate it? No, of course not. It's just not a movie that I would hold in higher regard than Disney films I like. However, this list is just getting started. Number 10, 101 Dalmatians. An English couple's pair of dogs have 15 puppies that a friend of the couple's named Corella DeVille wants to have as a way to make a fur coat. If she existed in real life, I'm sure PETA wouldn't think twice about adding her as their spokeswoman. Anyway, the puppies are kidnapped and it's up to the dogs to save them. Again, this is a movie that I just find boring. But, it's about dogs. However, wouldn't it have been so much cooler if the dogs were robot dogs running around with ray guns and blowing up things with flaming cats? Don't question my high expectations! Yeah, that's really my only complaint. However, there are several things I still like about it. I love the relationship between Pongo and Perdita. It's rare when you see a non-human Disney romance, and it's well done in here. Plus, Cruella DeVille is a great villain because there are people out there like her, and that's what makes her so scary. 
She's the kind of woman that you just want to throw red paint on. Also, a little tidbit. This movie was actually influential in Matt Groening because of the scenes in the movie where the characters watch a TV show. That inspired Matt to create a TV show within The Simpsons, and that's what led to Itchy and Scratchy. Another epic blow to the mind. Finally, I like how it was Disney's most modern film made at the time, as TVs weren't seen in any Disney films before it. So, it was pretty cool for a Disney film to take a break from the fairy tales and classic storybook plot lines, even though this movie is still based on a story, but still. Anyway, I just thought the movie is a little slow, and I'm just waiting for the climax, which is an awesome car chase. So, yeah, this is still a movie that I enjoy, but it's still not one of my favorites. Number 9, Lady and the Tramp. Another animal movie. You might want to keep that in mind, folks. This is going to be a recurring theme on this list. So, this movie tells the story of a domesticated dog named Lady who falls in love with a stray dog whose Lady's friends don't like. Yeah, this is another boring Disney movie in vain of the previous two spots. However, at least those movies led to SOMETHING! What does this movie lead to? What is the big payoff? What is the epic conclusion to this story? Tramp kills a rat. A rat. A mother ducking, brother bucking rat. Really? I may hark on Pixar, but I think all their movies have had a better climax than that. I was always bothered by that as a kid, and that made this not one of my favorites. Now that I'm grown, although I still think this movie's flawed, there are some good things about it. Once again, the romance is strong between Lady and Tramp. I love the contrast of backgrounds between both of them. Although, I do think it gets kind of corny with the cliché, he has his faults, but I should still love him, bullspit. But other than that, I still like the development of the romance. And finally, my favorite part of the movie, the Siamese Cats. God, I love that song. How could anyone not love that song? People complain about the Chinese stereotypes, don't they? Oi. Folks, it was the 50s. Ethnic stereotypes were common back in the day, and judging them from a modern standpoint is uneducated and pointless. Plus, it's a freaking Disney movie. Grow some guts, wussies. It's not like they're saying all Chinese people should die. Taint funny, McGee. While I'm thinking about it, stop watching Disney movies frame by frame to find some kind of hidden message. Don't you have noobs to own in online gaming? Anyway, Lady and the Tramp. A rather boring film, but the Siamese cats make it worth a view for me. Number 8. Lilo and Stitch. In this film, an alien comes down from space and lands in Hawaii where a little girl befriends it. But the alien's creator and sidekick try to recapture it. This movie isn't a rip-off of another movie. Okay, so it is. But, hey, at least it's only the first rip-off of that movie. You went there, didn't you? Yes, folks. Disney doesn't dodge the bullet when it comes to ripping off movies. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't think that was a major fault of this movie. It's just the kid befriending alien storyline we've seen before, and I'm not a fan of E.T. in the first place. However, this tries to make up for it by adding drama when it comes to the relationship between Lilo and her sister, Nani. I think they could have made a Disney movie off of that, but they had to add the merchandising. However, I actually like Stitch. I don't know why, he just cracks me up. It's probably the voice. It's that kind of sound that I'm not used to hearing. However, it still doesn't excuse the predictable and cliched plotline. Combined with the good elements, the bad elements just make this movie okay for me. It's not something that I would watch that much, but it's starting to spun on my Disney movie collection. Probably because I got it for free. I love it when I receive gifts from people, and the bonuses are nice too. A free back scratcher along with a free movie? Who could ask for more? Number 7. I'm probably going to get a lot of hate mail for this. Me getting hate mail? Real shocker. But, I guess this really is a big shocker, seeing as how there are only three people in this world that don't like this movie. And that is, The Lion King. You know the story. 
Mufasa is killed by his brother, Scar, who also tries to kill the son of Mufasa, Simba. So, Scar becomes the new king, and he uses his new position for tyranny, while Simba is far away living a fun life with his new friends. However, when Simba is visited by characters from his past, he realizes he must learn to return home to be the rightful king. I fit in the minority that thinks this film is overrated. I just don't get what everybody is raving about. It's something that's been done before. It's not that groundbreaking. That, and then there's the casting of... Celebrities. Matthew Broderick as adult Simba. Why, Disney? And, I love Cheech Marin, but in a Disney film? Sorry, but where's Tommy? James Earl Jones as James Earl Jones. Jeremy Irons as Jeremy Irons. The main actor that I think gives the best performance is Jim Cummings as Ed. That character never even speaks. All he does is laugh, and I think that is the best performance. Jim Cummings, you are amazing. Also, some of the songs are... God, please don't make me think about them. I love Circle of Life and Be Prepared. The rest? Just stab a gazelle red through my ear. Plus, I hate the total 180 that Scar goes through in this movie. He starts out as evil, conniving, and sinister, but then he turns into a teen mom, always whining and complaining. God, he should have been a villainess. So, with all my complaining, you might think I hate this movie. Actually, I kind of like it. I love the backgrounds. I actually believe I'm in Africa, even though I know they're just paintings and drawings. And I love Timon and Pumbaa. They should have just made the movie about them. Oh, they did. Good. Plus, it's no wonder the characters got their own Disney Afternoon cartoon. So, yes, The Lion King is a movie I find to be really overrated. Up there with Pixar movie level overratedness. But, if it wasn't for the African setting and Timon and Pumbaa, I probably wouldn't have spent 20 bucks on the DVD. Okay, I know what you're thinking. For a list of Disney movies I don't like very much, I'm sure being nice to them. Well, from this point, it's no holds barred, no sugar coating, and no mercy. From this point on, these are the movies that I want to accept the DVDs of as gifts. And despise with a passion. Number 6. Chicken Little. Yeah, I bet none of you saw this coming. Anyway, this is a modern day retelling of the Chicken Little tale that takes place in a suburban neighborhood populated by anthropomorphic animals. And when Chicken Little says the sky is falling, it's another way of saying that aliens are invading. My biggest problem is that they try to make a full-length movie out of a short fable, so they have to add a whole bunch of uninteresting story elements to beef it up. If this movie was being developed while Walt Disney was still alive, I bet he would have made it a straightforward story and made it a short, not a theatrical movie. But we ended up with this. Another added in element is the alien invasion gimmick. Yeah, if all else fails, bring in the aliens. Then, there's a cliched story of a son trying to make his dad proud of him. Cut me a break, Disney. That's something Pixar would make a movie out of. And finally, this movie isn't funny. I just felt like I was watching a Disney Channel sitcom with the characters wearing animal costumes. I remember the jokes coming off more as odd and random than funny. The only thing I liked about this movie was that it was Don Knotts' second to last film role. It's Don Knotts. He does his best as always. I just hope he went out with a bang in his last film role. Truck you, Disney. Anyway, Chicken Little. It is what it is. And what it is isn't that good. Number 5. Fantasia 2000. This was a movie I had no choice but to get, seeing as how it was included in a double feature with the original Fantasia. Sometimes in order to find gold, you have to dig through all the dirt. However, calling this movie dirt would be a compliment. Anyway, right off the bat, a sequel to Fantasia? I'm sorry, but that's a bomb waiting to happen. Fantasia is one of those movies that absolutely can't have a sequel. Originally, Walt Disney wanted to make a sequel to Fantasia, but the first one cost so much money that he had to scrap the idea. It's Fantasia. You can't even try to top that.
but they did. And they failed horribly. For starters, the runtime. The original Fantasia was over two hours long. This one is a mere hour and ten minutes. Really? When I hear Fantasia 2000, I expect Fantasia, the bigger and more grand than the original. Even though I still think the original will be better, I would think that they would at least try to be more epic, but it's hard to do that in an hour and ten minute time frame. Second, they reused the Sorcerer's Apprentice from Fantasia. Wow. That just shows how lazy this production was. They actually repeat a segment from the prequel. Could you imagine if in Die Hard 2, they reuse a scene where John McClane while hanging from a fire hose jumps off the roof of the building? Of course you couldn't. Sequels aren't supposed to reuse footage from the prequels. Most of the time, anyway. Then, there are the celebrities. Ugh. I can understand Quincy Jones, Bette Midler, James Earl Jones, and Angela Lansbury. Those people actually understand music and Disney, but Steve Martin? Penn and Teller? What? Did they beg Disney at gunpoint to be in this? Finally, this movie is missing what made Fantasia so great. The artistry. The artistry of combining animation with music, and how elegantly the animation flowed with the music, and how each segment fit together perfectly into one movie. With this movie, they make different styles of animation, so it feels like you're watching a completely different movie with each segment. However, I love the segments directed by Eric Goldberg. He knew what he was doing. Everything else... UGH! So, Fantasia 2000. Back then, if something had 2000 in the name, you knew it was crap. Number 4. Brother Bear. UGH! Anyway, this movie takes place in Alaska where an Eskimo named Kenai kills a bear to avenge the death of his brother, who the bear killed. However, the spirit of the dead brother thinks Kenai's crime is against the belief that every living creature is equal, so Kenai is turned into a bear as punishment and must learn what it's like to love as a bear with the help of... Kid Audience Magnets. So, what's wrong with this movie? It's dull. Really? Really? Dull. I was able to predict everything that was going to happen. The dialogue shows it was written in the early 2000s. I grew up at that time, and I didn't find those phrases charming. It's a straightforward buddy comedy. Nothing that creative or interesting. It's just two bears that can't get along going on an adventure. I feel like I'm watching a 2D Pixar movie. Finally, Phil Collins. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of Phil Collins. His stint in Genesis as the frontman is one of my favorite bands of all time. But then, he had to sing songs for Disney soundtracks. I can forgive Tarzan. Those songs were sung over montages. Even though they didn't always match what they were actually montaging over. But in this movie, his songs felt like they were shoved in at random. At moments where you think you're going to get dialogue or a powerful moment, Phil Collins' song! It's so irritating! It's like they forgot to write the dialogue for some scenes, so they just played Phil Collins over the animation. I don't blame Phil. It's not like he was the one editing the film together. So, yeah. Brother Bear is one of those early signs that Disney was going downhill quickly, and it's a movie that I wouldn't recommend to any Disney fan. Number 3. Oliver and Company. There's probably only a handful of you who remember this movie. And that's not surprising. So, what's this movie about? It's Oliver Twist with animals. No, I'm not kidding. It's there right in the title. Oliver and Company. It's about a cat who gets lost from his owner, and he is taken in by a group of stray dogs and a bum who owes money to some businessman, and I don't know, this plot has Tourette's. Yeah, I already answered what the biggest problem with this movie is. It's Oliver Twist with animals. Disney, just because I love you doesn't mean you get to do the same thing that I don't like about Pixar. You can't just take an established story, make minor tweaks, and leave it at that. We all know the story, so we all know what's going to happen. There are no surprises and nothing to suspect because people are familiar with the story that a movie is borrowing the plot for. Anyway, that's only the first problem. The next problem is the songs. I love Billy Joel and Bette Midler, but the songs in this movie just sound like they were from the 80s. 
I'm not saying they're bad, they're just forgettable. I can't remember how many songs were in this movie. I wouldn't mind a billion bet just saying the songs, but they also voice the characters that sing the songs. I'm sorry, but singers and voice actors aren't the same thing. And they don't do that good of jobs in my opinion. Then we have the villain. He, he's so bland, so forgettable, and so uninteresting that all I remember about him is how he dies, which is debatably the most gruesome villain death in a Disney movie. Anyway, the animation doesn't look like it's Disney. It looks more like if Filmation was given a movie budget. Anyway, Oliver and Company. If you don't remember it, good for you. Number two, The Rescuers. This movie is up there with The Lion King on Disney movies in the manner that I don't understand why it gets so much praise. However, where The Lion King had some things I like, this movie just makes me hide my head in shame of being a Disney fan. Anyway, this is about a little girl who lives in the swamp with a pawn shop owner and her assistant who G-ratingly treat her badly and want to use her to find a priceless diamond. So, two mice who are members of a rescue society are sent to save her. Oh. My. God. This movie is boring. And I do mean boring. Capital B-O-R-I-N-G. The plot is boring. The characters are boring. The dialogue is boring. Everything's boring! It's as straightforward as it gets. So boring that its climax is more boring than the build-up. What does this movie lead up to? The girl tries to get the diamond out from a school while the tide slowly comes in. Wow. And I thought the climax from the lay in the tramp was disappointing. At least that was based around a living thing. In this film, it's a diamond. Yay, excitement. Yeah, that's my biggest problem with this movie. It's a chore to sit through. I don't know how I was able to manage it as a kid. I'll give props to Rob Newhart and Eva Gabor. They at least try to make this movie interesting. But the story is so dull that even they can't make it exciting to watch. The Rescuers. The only rescuing that needs to be done is having somebody saving you from putting it in your DVD player. Or a VHS player. Take your pick. Number one. The Aristocats. My god. This movie makes the rescuer slightly more enjoyable. So, what's the plot? A cat and her kittens are almost killed by a rich woman's butler who wants to make himself entitled to the woman's inheritance when she dies. So, with the help of an alley cat, the cats try to make it home to expose the butler for what he did. Where do I even begin? Aside from the plot that is so uninspired and bland that Stephanie Meyer could write a more interesting story, I can't remember the names of any of the characters. I would rather listen to a marathon of Laird Skinner than to the songs in this movie. And finally, it's just a movie about cats being cats. That's it. They're just cats. Wow. Don't get me wrong, I'm a cat lover, but this movie makes me want to strangle kittens while their parents watch. It's like the babies in Rugrats. They just act like babies. There's nothing interesting about them. All they are are cats that act like cats. We've never seen that before, have we? What are these cats that you speak of? Yes, this is as bad as it gets, folks. Walt Disney would have been rolling in his grave. Speaking of him, this was the first Disney movie made after Walt Disney's death. Well, thank God Robin Hood came out after this, otherwise that studio would have been screwed. Bottom line, the Aristocats is a movie that I'm lucky I'm still alive after watching it. It's a movie that I never want to waste my time with again. I'm better off just looking at LOL cat pictures. So, there are the 11 Disney films that I don't like or despise with a passion. If you like any of these movies, good for you. I'm sorry if I killed your childhoods. However, they're just not movies that I would watch over my favorite Disney movies. Are there any Disney movies you don't like? I'm sure these aren't the only ones that have a low reception among Disney fans. Anyway, I'm Ben T. Looney, and I'm signing out. I'm going to go to my Cat Stranglers Anonymous meeting. Oh.